Today we're out here taking a look at one of the most fuel efficient vehicles you can buy in North America today, the recently refreshed 2020 Hyundai Ioniq plug-in hybrid. The basics of the Ioniq remain the same, but we get a restyled front end and we get a restyled interior with a new infotainment system in the dashboard. But a lot of the debate about the Ioniq and of course the Prius Prime, the other high efficiency plug-in hybrid available in America remain. A lot of folks out there in the green community dismiss plug-in hybrids like this as having less impact than going full battery electric vehicle. But I would argue that the decision process for buying a plug-in hybrid like this or like the Prius Prime really depends on your view of overall efficiency. I'd also suggest that it requires a little bit of altruistic thinking as well, because if you were to build 11 of these with the same number of lithium ion battery cells that you could build one long range EV with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, you would be having a much bigger environmental impact by building and selling 11 of these, if of course 11 people were interested in them. The reason for that would be if you out there watching this video replaced, say, your late model Toyota Corolla with a brand new 100 kilowatt hour battery pack EV, you would take your personal gasoline consumption from around 500 gallons a year down to zero gallons a year, but there would still be 10 other vehicles out there that are driving out around using gasoline, using other energy sources. So whether you're thinking of energy independence, the cost of operation, or the environmental impact of consuming gasoline, if you were to instead take that 100 kilowatt hours of batteries and build 11 Ionic plugins or 11 Prius primes, you would then reduce overall fuel consumption not by 500 gallons a year, but by about 4,600 gallons a year, assuming you're replacing a relatively efficient compact sedan but more on that a little later. Up front, we find a grille shape that is similar to what we see in other modern Hyundais, but it is a little bit more demure than what we see in something like the new Hyundai Sonata. We have full LED headlamps up here, but we do have incandescent turn signals right there in the middle. I do wish that these had been LEDs right there. No fog lamps down below, but we do find some functional air vents, well-integrated front parking sensors, and that Hyundai logo does hide a radar adaptive cruise control sensor. Up front, I have to say that this is, in my opinion, one of the most handsome compact sedans available in America, and that's why I've long had the Ionic on our must-buy list for compact stands. If you're out there looking for something like a Honda Civic, especially the Honda Civic without the turbocharged engine or a Toyota Corolla or anything along those lines, you would do well to put the Hyundai Ioniq on your shopping list. All Ionic trims get standard forward collision warning with autonomous braking and a basic lane keeping assistance system as well. Our model has all of the optional features on it, which include radar adaptive cruise control that expands the autonomous braking to include pedestrians. We also get a more advanced lane centering system and blind spot monitoring on this model. Moving to the side, we have some distinctive aerodynamic wheels and 205 with tires, pretty standard for a compact sedan in America. I know that many of you are thinking, but it's not a sedan, it is a liftback, and that is true. This is a five-door liftback. You can see right there that what looks like a trunk lid and the rear window open as one piece. This is a style that is very similar to what we saw in the Chevy Volt and has logically been more or less applied to the Toyota Prius Prime as well. That's because a lot of folks out there prefer a more traditional sedan shape and so they've styled this more practical liftback format to look like a sedan and appease some of those compact sedan shoppers out there. In terms of overall length, the Ionic is still shorter than some of the large compact sedans that we find in America now, especially something like the all-new Volkswagen Jetta, but this is still solidly in the compact category, especially Especially on the inside where we find considerably more interior room than we find in subcompact stands out there and also it's worth noting more room on the inside than we find in the Toyota Prius. Moving to the rear, we find restyled tail lamp modules. These remind me a little bit of modern Nissan designs with this sort of triangular theme going on there. Now these are combination LED elements. So the brake lights are LEDs as are the parking lights, but the turn signals and the backup lights remain incandescent. At the bottom of the bumper, we have reflectors. These are not additional light modules. And then we have well-integrated parking sensors in that black section. As we see in some other hybrids out there, we have another window right here in the lift gate. So we have one window up top, one window here, and then this sort of spoiler S treatment that makes this look kind of like a sedan divides the two windows from one another. So when you're looking through the rear view mirror, you're looking through both of these windows. Under the hood, we find essentially the same hybrid system that we find in the regular version of the Ionic and of course the closely related Kia Nero as well. This is a 1.6 liter four cylinder engine. It runs on the Atkinson cycle and alone it produces 104 horsepower and 109 pound feet of torque. 
Mated to the engine is an axial electric motor or a pancake electric motor, whatever you want to call it, and it produces 60 horsepower in this model that's up from 43 in the regular hybrid, but it makes the same amount of torque, 125 pound-feet. It is then connected to a six-speed dual-clutch transmission that then drives the front wheels. This is a very different setup than what we see in the Toyota Prius Prime, which uses a two-motor and planetary gear set hybrid system. Because of the way this hybrid system is assembled, it can take advantage of the bigger battery pack to deliver more power under the hood. You'll You'll notice that the combined horsepower total is 156, up from 139 in the regular model, and nearly 200 pound-feet of torque, up from 173 in the regular hybrid model. And that's because of the 8.9 kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery pack in the rear, up from basically 1.6 kilowatt hours in the regular hybrid. Not only can this battery pack store more power, it can dissipate that power more rapidly, allowing the electric motor to give us more oomph. Now the downside is increased weight. This system weighs 320 pounds more than the regular hybrid, and that's why fuel economy drops from between 55 and 58 miles per gallon combined in that model, down to 52 miles per gallon for the Ionic plug-in hybrid. As with most hybrid and plug-in hybrid vehicles out there, the nominal capacity of this battery pack is not 100% available to you as a driver. A certain portion of it is reserved in order to increase the lifetime of the battery pack. Although it's likely that this battery pack is allowing a little bit more access to that nominal capacity than the battery in the Prius Prime, that's the most likely reason that we have a longer range, 29 miles in this and 25 miles in the Prius Prime, even though the battery packs are essentially the same size. This car, very much like the Prius Prime, operates on the concept of gasoline mitigation or gasoline consumption reduction, whatever you want to call it, not elimination. If you want to eliminate gasoline and you want Nionic, there's a full battery version for you. Instead, what we see in this vehicle is similar to what we see in the Prius Prime. Rather than burning 500 gallons of gasoline in the average Toyota Corolla or Honda Civic or Hyundai Elantra, you could get one of these guys and burn on average about 50 gallons a year for the average American in their average commute. That is, of course, assuming that you can charge both at the office and at home. Your consumption may vary depending on where you're able to charge. Where things start to diverge is their behavior in EV mode. This vehicle can give you 60 horsepower in EV mode. You can definitely climb up hills if you do it at a moderate speed, and you can go over freeway overpasses, again, if you're not too hard on the throttle. But the Prius Prime will stay in EV mode longer because it's giving us nearly 60% more power in EV mode than we find out of this plug-in hybrid system. The other design consideration is cabin heating. We don't have a heat pump under here, and we don't have an auxiliary cabin heater either. So if it's cold outside and you need to heat the cabin, it will actually start the gasoline engine. It will use it to generate power and send it to the battery pack, but it is using gasoline, essentially, to heat the cabin. That design consideration certainly rankles some folks out there, but it's not wasting that gasoline. It is generating electricity with the gasoline and then sending it to the vehicle's electrical system. So it just depends on how much gasoline you really want to save. If you want to drop your gas consumption to zero, again, there's a full battery electric version of the Ionic for you. When it comes to front seat comfort, I give these seats 9 out of 10 points when compared against the Prius or, of course, the average compact stand in America. We are driving the top end trim, which means we have a two-position seat memory over there on the door two-way lumbar support right there on the driver's seat, and we have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. Like most mainstream compact stands in America, however, the front passenger seat remains a manual seat design. Hopping into the rear, we find a decent amount of legroom back here. I have about three or four inches of legroom sitting right there behind myself. This is the kind of vehicle where you could just barely fit a rear-facing child seat in and an adult up front if you needed to. We do have more combined legroom in here than we find in the Prius, and this is pretty similar to a lot of mainstream compact sedans out there. Unfortunately, like many compact mainstream sedans, the roof line does drop a little bit towards the rear, and that means that if I wanted to put my head all the way back there toward the headrest, I do have to crane my head to one side just a little bit. But for the average seating position, as long as you're not putting your head on that headrest, I actually have about half an inch of headroom. It's just due to the overall really curved in shape of the roof line back there as it goes towards the hatch. Hopping into the middle seat position, it's important to remember that the Ionic is a compact sedan, so the rear bench is certainly not going to be as wide as something like a Sonata Hybrid or, of course, a Camry Hybrid as well. And then moving all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. You can see I still have about half an inch of overall legroom left. Overall parts quality is pretty similar to other high efficiency hybrids out there like the Prius lineup, but I think that Hyundai does a slightly better job of disguising some of the less expensive components. So for instance, we have hard plastics back here, but they have an attractive texture to them and we still have a soft touch armrest on the door. The front door styling is pretty similar, but this entire upper door section is a soft touch material and then we have a soft touch armrest below. Hyundai locates the battery pack right under the rear cargo area and as a result, 
cargo area does decrease if you get the plug-in hybrid model. But it's not as big of a decrease as we see from the Prius to the Prius Prime, and that's what gives this a larger cargo area than we find in the Prius Prime. Even though the cargo area is smaller than the regular Ionic, this is certainly larger than pretty much any compact sedan out there, and definitely more convenient as well. Going in for a closer look, you can see the cooling fan and the cooling ducts for the battery. This battery is air-cooled like many hybrid vehicles out there. I do have to say, though, I wish that they had put this blower motor in a slightly more convenient spot so that way you could use some of that additional storage area right there. There is a plastic divider that pops right in that zone, and it does have cutouts, so that way the roller cargo cover that we can see right there has a place to go. If we turn it around you can slot it right in there and then put the lid all the way down. The soft touches in this cabin help make it feel a little bit more premium than the regular versions of the Prius. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, two-way adjustable headrests, and our model has a pretty standard sized moonroof right there. The model that we're driving has this attractive two-tone leather upholstery interior, and you did hear that right, this is real leather, not imitation leather like we find in some other hybrids out there. If we move back over to the doors, we see the bottle holder down there at the bottom, a mid-range speaker grill, and then a tweeter speaker grill right there integrated with the door handle. Very similar overall interior styling to the Ionic previously, but the big difference happens right here in the middle of the dashboard where we find one of their latest infotainment screens. This is the new 10 and a quarter inch screen that's been working its way across the Hyundai lineup. In this version of the software, Apple CarPlay does occupy the entire screen, which is my preference. I'm not quite sure why in some Hyundai vehicles it does and why in some it does not. Hyundai's infotainment system is one of my favorites. It is pretty intuitive and easy to use. It's not quite as feature rich as some of the systems out there, but it does have some interesting new features like you can get for some reason sounds of nature. I'm not quite sure why you would want that. And then of course we have our plug-in hybrid screen right there for energy information, EV range, driving, etc. But again, you will notice that if I go over to the energy information screen and then I start the automatic climate control down here because it is cooler outside, the engine actually starts up and you can see it is generating electricity and sending it over there to the battery because that is how it heats the cabin. We have touch buttons for those direct access links right there across the screen and then touch buttons for the dual zone automatic climate control down here as well. There's a driver only mode in order to save energy. Below that we have a single USB input, two 12 volt power ports, and then a place where you can put your smartphone. There is a Qi wireless charger right under there. We have a traditional console shifter right here. So if you're looking for a hybrid without one of those joystick shifters, this is gonna be an option for you. Drive is down there, sport mode over to the left, and then we can push up for gear up, pull down for gear down. And that does actually change gears because again, this uses a six speed dual clutch transmission. We have electric parking brake right there, auto brake hold, heated seats, and then a button to change the hybrid and EV mode. We have two different cup holders here. One is a round one and one is sort of D-shaped right there. This holds juice boxes or larger box drinks a little bit better. And you notice kind of interesting slot there that allows you to put smaller tablet computers right there in that little slot rather than them being in this storage area there. One problem with that, of course, is that they're still out there visible to everybody. This does not slide forward and backward, it just latches right there into place. On the driver's side, we find a partial LCD cluster. On the left side and on the right side, we have some LED gauges. This is the power eco and charge gauge over there on the left. And on the right side, we find the battery level. The bottom white portion there really is the portion that is reserved for hybrid operation. And then we find a fuel gauge below. As we see in other Hyundai models, the display is bright and crisp. We have a variety of different readouts there, trip fuel economy. We can also see turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, the status of the vehicle's active safety systems, and then of course adjust certain vehicle settings within this interface as well. But it's not as configurable as some LCD clusters out there. It does change when we're in the eco mode and then move over to the sport mode. You can see that we get a definite different look there. The display changes to give us a tachometer right there in the middle that we don't see when we're in the eco mode. But aside from that, there are no real changes as we cycle from auto hybrid vehicle to EV mode. The steering wheel design is basically the same as before. We have a flat bottom down there and pretty aggressive sport grips for hybrid. Also unusual for a hybrid are these paddles right back there on the back of the steering wheel. These adjust the regen braking when we're in the regular drive mode. You can increase regen braking with this paddle right here, decrease it with the one over here on the right. And then when in sport mode, they function as traditional shift paddles, gear up with the one on the right and then gear down with the one on the left. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find controls for the infotainment system. And on the right side, we find the controls for that multifunction LCD and the radar adaptive cruise control system that's optional. When operating in hybrid mode, overall zero to 60 times are pretty close to the regular version of the Ionic. That's because even though we have about 300 pounds extra curb weight, we also have a little bit more power from the engine. 
And that's what enabled this model to go zero to 60 in 9.7 seconds. That's also pretty average when we're talking about the efficient hybrids that are available in America. This is really pretty similar to what we see in the Toyota Prius Prime. In our braking tests, this model took 121 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's definitely better than the last Prius Prime that we tested, and actually pretty good for the compact stance segment in general. That braking distance honestly surprised me a little bit. I had expected this model to be right around 130 feet with the extra weight and the 205 width tires. But when talking about curb weight in a vehicle like the Ionic, it's important to remember that the weight in this vehicle is more evenly distributed than we find in the average compact stand in America, and you'll really notice that out on winding mountain roads like this. This definitely doesn't have wide tires. The tires are not summer tires or extra grippy tires or anything like that, but this does have a better weight balance than the average compact front wheel drive sedan, simply because of that big battery pack in the rear. The extra 300 pounds almost entirely goes to the rear of the vehicle. And because that weight is on top of or slightly in front of the rear axle, it doesn't have the same effect as adding weight to the extreme rear of a vehicle behind the rear axle. So it really does help improve the overall balance of the Ionic. The other thing that really helps out handling in the Ionic is that we have a fully independent suspension on all four corners. And that's something that, for instance, we don't find in the current generation Mazda 3 anymore. In situations on rougher pavement in corners where the Mazda 3's rear suspension could get upset and where it overall felt a little bit bouncy, the Ionic feels an awful lot more planted and an awful lot more sure-footed. But of course, the grip is lower because of the 205 with tires. But this is the kind of vehicle where you could put wider tires on it if you wanted to and really improve the overall handling. And thanks to the hybrid system, you would still have a very efficient vehicle overall. Obviously not as efficient as if you kept the OEM tires on it, but it would still be very, very efficient. When it comes to overall ride quality, I'm going to give this a B plus when it comes to the average compact sedan in America. There are definitely a great number of sedans in this category that are significantly firmer, but a number of the softer entries have actually left since we last took a look at this model. So something like the current generation Nissan Sentra has definitely gone in a more sporting direction and it's not as comfortable as it once was out on the road. The Ionic does a relatively decent job of soaking up some of the large and small imperfections out here on this gravel road, and it is worth noting that even though this is a hybrid, we actually get a little bit more ground clearance than a few of the compact sedans available in America. Back out on the paved road, the Ionic suspension is definitely well suited to a longer highway journey. This is the kind of vehicle where it wouldn't really be a problem to drive this for hours and hours at end. It's also worth noting that this hybrid system definitely has better highway fuel economy than some other hybrids out there. So if you are looking for a vehicle that gets excellent fuel economy on those long highway journeys, this is going to be the option for you. If on the other hand you're looking for a vehicle that has better in-city fuel economy, that would be something like the Toyota Prius. It's just due to the overall hybrid system design. The other thing worth noting is the overall braking feel. Regen braking and friction braking are better blended in this than we find in the Prius, but the overall regen braking feel is still a little bit unusual because it's going through that six-speed dual clutch transmission. So as we start slowing down, even if we're slowing down gently here, when we're digging into that regen braking, you will feel the transmission shift as we start slowing down. That shifting behavior has consistently been refined by Hyundai, but it is still there and you will still notice it. I have to say overall, however, I prefer the braking feel in this vehicle over what we see in the Prius. The big difference is when you're going down a hill like this and you're braking lightly and then you dig into the brakes and have a more aggressive braking event, this feels much more like a traditional vehicle, whereas in a lot of Toyota hybrid systems, there feels like there's this moment where nothing's going on and then the brakes engage. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we scored 73 decibels in here. This is a little bit louder than some of the compact stands you could compare this with. Wind noise is well controlled in here, but it seems like we have less sound deadening material, especially in the wheel wells, so road noise is a little bit more pronounced in the cabin. When it comes to fuel economy, the Ionic plug-in has been very impressive. We've been averaging just over 53 miles per gallon when driving this as a hybrid, and that is not charging it at all on either end of my daily commute. Remember, I do go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, and although this may seem a little bit unintuitive, generally speaking, a lot of plug-in hybrid vehicles end up a little bit better in that fuel economy test than the average hybrid vehicle because they can recoup more energy going down the hill. And I think that's what applies to this that also applies to the Prius Prime. We also, generally speaking, get more aggressive regen braking and plug-in hybrids because the battery packs can accept that charge faster. Bottom lining the Ionic out on the road is pretty easy for me. I prefer the way that this drives over the Prius Prime. Some of that has to do with the stepped automatic transmission. It definitely has a more traditional feel to it, a little bit more engaging, especially if you want to have a little bit of extra fun and you want to start using the shift paddles out on your favorite winding mountain road. 
The overall handling ability in the Ionic plugin is pretty decent for something that's so efficiency focused. And then of course, if we move this over to the eco mode, then those paddles revert to their regen braking function where we can adjust the regen braking in four different levels. And that's something that we don't see in a lot of hybrids out there, but it is something that I really appreciate, especially if you live in a hilly climate. Regen paddles are something that we don't find in every hybrid or plug-in hybrid out there, but it's a feature that I really appreciate living in a hilly area myself. For 2020, the Ionic continues to be priced right in the thick of things for the compact sedan segment. Again, even though the Ionic is a liftback, it is definitely styled more sedan-like, very much like we see in the Prius Prime. So I think that anybody shopping for a Corolla or a Civic or an Elant or anything in that mainstream compact sedan category ought to be willing to take a look at some of these more fuel-efficient options like the Ionic. If you want the hybrid model that gets 59 miles per gallon, that starts at $23,200. But if you qualify for all the tax incentives, the plug-in hybrid will undercut that a little bit. Because even though the MSRP starts at $26,500, it does qualify for up to $4,543 back from the feds, bringing it down to $21,975, just a little bit less expensive than the non-plug-in model. That does drop down your fuel economy, however, so if you're doing a lot of long-distance driving and you don't ever intend to plug it in, the plug-in hybrid's not going to be the best option for you, because fuel economy goes from 59 down to 52 miles per gallon. But on the other hand, you do get nearly 30 miles of EV range. If you're the category of plug-in hybrid shopper that says, I never use any gasoline, I haven't burnt gasoline in a year, that's something that I used to hear from a lot of early plug-in hybrid adopters, then my advice to you would be to just buy the battery electric version that gives you 170 miles of range, and after tax credits, that'll come in around $25,545. That's the model that's targeted at someone that wants to go cold turkey on gasoline, move completely to electricity. The plug-in hybrid is for someone that's in the middle. They want to be able to do their daily commute on electricity, but they want that safety cushion of being able to drive down to Los Angeles if they needed to without having to hunt for a charging station. That, of course, is the same use case as the Prius Prime, really the only direct competitor to the Ionic now that the Chevy Volt has gone. The Volt was really the poster child for plug-in hybrids for a while, but as I've said before, the Volt ultimately ended up being a little bit too compromised on both sides. When we take a look at overall fuel efficiency, for instance, the Prius Prime is 33% more efficient than the Volt when operating as an EV, and 35% more efficient when operating as a hybrid. So that reality combined with the expiration of tax credits for General Motors plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles is the reason that GM decided to stop making the Volt. Diving into comparisons, let's talk about the Prius Prime first. Obviously, the Prius Prime and the Ionic are both targeting ultra-high efficiency, but here, the Prius Prime definitely wins. The Delta is obviously not as big as Prius Prime to Chevy Volt, but you'll still get slightly better economy in the Prius Prime, 133 MPGE and 54 miles per gallon when operating as a hybrid. The Prius Prime also allows you to stay in that EV mode a little bit longer because it can deliver more power in the EV mode, thanks to the way that they've chosen to make the two electric motors work together the overall power dissipation abilities from the battery pack. And of course, the big deal to some plug-in hybrid shoppers out there is the fact that the plug-in hybrid version of the Ionic will never completely avoid using gasoline in colder weather. It will turn on the engine in order to heat the cabin, and the Prius Prime won't do that. Now, that will really seriously drop your range in the Prius Prime, of course, because it's using the battery to heat the cabin, but if you have a relatively short commute, you're not driving up too many steep hills, and you're not going terribly fast, the Prius Prime in all weather conditions is going to be more likely to stay in battery only mode than the Ionic. But you do have to give up a little bit of personality in the process. I think the Ionic is slightly better looking, I think it's a little bit more engaging, and we have a bigger cargo area in the back. The efficiency numbers are obviously very good in the Ionic, but they are truly impressive in the Prius Prime. When you look at it this way, remember that the Prius Prime is one of the most efficient gasoline vehicles in America and simultaneously one of the most efficient electric vehicles in America. And when it's operating as an electric vehicle, it's lugging around a gasoline engine and this massive amount of weight that it doesn't need to carry around. And when it's operating as a hybrid vehicle, it's carrying around a much bigger battery pack than a regular hybrid needs. So it's really impressive that Toyota has been able to give that Prius Prime such lofty fuel economy numbers. Next up, we have the Kia Niro, obviously the close cousin to the Ionic. Essentially, you'd want to get a Niro over an Ionic if you really want a hatchback and you want that sort of mini crossover styling, and you'd want to get an Ionic over a Niro if you prefer the ultimate in efficiency. You definitely lose a few MPGs here. It'll cost you 14 MPGE and 3 miles of range, and then when it's operating as a hybrid, 6 MPG overall. But aside from that, the two vehicles are very, very similar. They really handle an awful lot alike, even though we have a slightly taller box in the Nero, 
and the drivetrains feel very, very similar as well. We also have a slightly refreshed interior for the Nero for 2020, although we don't know exactly what the Nero EV is going to bring us. It's worth noting if you're thinking about one of these vehicles as an EV, the Nero EV and the Ionic EV are not the same EV system, which is a little weird actually, because the Ionic and the Nero are the close sister ships in the Hyundai Kia envelope, and the Kona is much more distantly related. But for some reason, the Nero and the Kona share electric drivetrains, and the Ionic is the one that's a little bit more distantly related, even though the platforms of the vehicle are again more similar. As a result of this interesting love triangle, you get much more range in the Nero EV than we get in the Ionic EV, and more power out of the system as well. Although it sounds odd, there is some logic to the madness there. The Ionic is focused on ultra efficiency, so everything about the battery electric drivetrain, the plug-in hybrid drivetrain, and the hybrid drivetrain is targeting efficiency. Whereas the Nero is willing to give up some efficiency to give you the longer range, to give you the different practicality realities, etc. Last up, we have the Honda Clarity. Obviously, this is not a compact sedan, but it is one of the few vehicles that is about in the same price range here. It starts at $33,400, so notably more expensive, but because of its bigger battery pack, it qualifies for a bigger federal tax credit, up to $7,500. And that will bring its real base price down to $25,900. The big thing to keep in mind about the Clarity is that it is Honda Accord sized. So if you're specifically looking for something that's small and easy to park, that's not really going to be the Clarity. I also have to say I like the Clarity's interior styling. It's as attractive to me as the exterior is unattractive to some folks. And that is the thing to keep in mind about the Clarity. The styling is decidedly unusual. We have the wheel skirts in the back that help improve overall aerodynamic efficiency. The front end doesn't really look exactly like a Honda Accord. It looks sort of like a Honda Accord got melted in the sun. And then the trunk is sort of a combination of trunk meets lift back meets extra glass section inserted. So there's a lot of funkiness going on on the outside of the Clarity for sure, and some folks will definitely be bothered by that. But on the flip side, the interior is lovely, it's very comfortable, and we do get particularly impressive fuel economy ratings for a vehicle its size. 110 mpge, 42 miles per gallon. Some folks might not be too impressed by the 42 mile per gallon part, but remember it has a 48 mile electric range. So in all likelihood, you are going to be using that gasoline engine an awful lot less. For instance, on my daily commute where I go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, the Clarity is able to stay completely in electric only mode the entire time and therefore use zero gasoline and it will heat the cabin in the winter. Versus the Ionic, the Ionic will have to start the engine to help me go up and over that hill. So even though fuel efficiency for that gasoline engine is very, very high and overall efficiency is still high, it's still burnt gasoline in a situation where the Clarity wouldn't. But that said, it's obviously going to be more expensive. And lastly, because of the somewhat controversial styling, Honda hasn't sold as many Clarities as they really hoped to in America, and that's why they've sort of pulled back on the sales network. You can still order the Clarity in a wide variety of different areas, but most dealers outside of California and the main ZEV states in the US are not going to be stocking Clarities. So you may have difficulties driving one, even if you would be able to order one and then buy it later. Personally, I think that's a pity because if you can look beyond the exterior styling, the Clarity is an excellent option in this segment. Be sure and let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section and what would you pick if you were shopping in this segment? I have to say, I like the Ionic a little bit more than the Prius in terms of the overall styling, the functionality, etc., and I might be willing to give up the efficiency in order to get that extra style and the more usable infotainment system, etc., than what we see in the Prius. However, the whole point of this particular mini segment is fuel efficiency, and nothing beats the Prius for that at the moment. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below, and what would you get if you were shopping? I also have to admit, I might just get the Clarity, because if I was already giving up efficiency, then I might want the extra size, the extra performance, and of course the extra electric range that we see in the Clarity, as long as again you can get over the exterior styling. Let me know that down there in the comment section below. Find me over at facebook.com slash so you can see what I'm driving this week. You can also head over to Instagram to see the lighter side of this channel, and of course find our other gardening channel, The Mountain Garden. You'll find a link to that at the end. I'll see you all later.